in the last three modules, we've looked at four different concepts. The global commons, public goods, sovereign territoriality, and finally, the distinction between space and place. So now I think it's time for us in this final module to bring all four of these concepts together to explain what it is that makes the maritime domain unique. So let's first sort of just build on that idea of space and place, the distinction between the two, of space being empty and abstract and place being concrete and filled with meaning. Meaning given by whom? Given by individual human beings, given by social collectivities, communities, nations, tribes. We all give meaning to the spaces we occupy. The spaces become places. And why is this relevant to the oceans? Why is it relevant to the maritime domain? To that, we've got to understand our essential biology. Human beings are animals. Homo sapiens is an animal species. We are a terrestrial species. We are a wingless species. So naturally, our natural habitat is land. It's not air. It's not water. So air and water, therefore, in that sense, are alien habitats for us. And for most of human history, therefore, the seas have been seen as these empty wastelands. It is said that when Alexander the Great first viewed the oceans, he was terrified. You know, he thought of himself as the emperor of the world. He went and militarily occupied all of the known world, but he was scared of the waters. So in his conception of the world itself, it was basically the land spaces of our planet. It was not the water-covered spaces of our planet. So for most human beings, in fact, the seas are essentially empty space. But that's not true for all human beings. There are many communities that live by the sea for whom the sea is integral to who they are, our coastal communities. Entire, entire populations depend upon the sea, see the sea as a neighbor, as a friend, also at times as, as an enemy. Our entire fishing communities across the, across the globe. Most of the major global cities, uh, the vast majority of them are coastal cities. So there has always been this extremely interesting relationship between human beings and the seas around them. And that is something that we need to understand as well when we think about the maritime domain. And particularly, there's been a, always been a group of human beings, the seafarers, the sailors, who make their living, their livelihood by traveling on the seas. And for them, of course, the sea is not an empty, abstract space. The sea is, in fact, for them, a very real place. There's a beautiful poem by John Macefield, Sea Fever. It is, it is a poem that really speaks to the soul of seafarers, those who actually travel on the oceans. I must down to the sea again, to the lonely sea and sky, and all I ask is a tall ship and a star to steer her by. So for some people, but only for some people, a minority, if you will, of human beings, the sea is not empty space, it is a place. So what does this mean concretely in terms of the oceans today? The graphic that you are seeing is about how, according to the law of the sea, the relationship between land and sea is legally determined. So we have... As you can see, according to the law of the sea, 12 nautical miles. 12 nautical miles is very much the territorial sea. There is no distinction legally between this part of the territory of a state and the part which is on land. For all practical purposes, every purpose indeed, this is a part of the state. And historically, as we've seen in an earlier module, this is linked to the range of the cannonball in earlier eras of technology. And that was 
what you needed to do in order to keep states safe. And then a further 12 nautical miles, taking you up to 24, is what's called the contiguous zone. And in the contiguous zone, essentially, states have every type of police right, coast guard rights, rights relating to epidemics, everything. That's the contiguous zone. And beyond that, up to 200 nautical miles is the exclusive economic zone of a state. This is the area in which other states have a right to transit these waters. Other states uh, have, have a right to use these waters purely for the purposes of transportation. When it comes to the exploitation of the resources up to that 200 nautical mile limit, exclusive economic zone, as the term itself denotes, entirely lies within the exclusive economic domain of a state. So this is, relates not so much to sovereignty in its security dimension, but sovereignty in its economic dimension. And out here, of course, it also depends on the geography, because potentially, uh, you know, depending upon the, the, the nature of the continental shelf, you have the slope, and the slope is followed by the rise before it gets to the deep oceans. So there is beyond 200 nautical miles potentially a further zone that is claimable by a state. But that's entirely really depends upon geography and geology. What is the nature of the seabed? So this is, this is really what the legal situation is. Let's bring this all together now. And that is what we are trying to do with this graphic. The four cardinal concepts. Global commons, public goods, sovereign territoriality, space and place. How do they all come together to create the maritime domain? Well, first of all, let us look at the notion of global commons. What does it imply? It implies that the seas are unowned. And because they are unowned, the high seas, they are liable to be overexploited. So that's one core characteristic of the maritime domain. The second, public goods. Because these are public goods, they are used by all. But the question remains, paid for by whom? The third aspect, sovereign territoriality. And what this implies is that states aspire to control, subject to their technological capabilities. Because this is seen as a form of territory, states will try to the extent that the technology permits them and their capabilities permit them to control these territories. And finally, space and place. The seas are lacking in significance, in meaning for most people. So that is what really fundamentally the maritime domain is about. It's a domain which is unowned, hence liable to be overexploited. It is used by all, with nobody willing to pay the costs for maintaining that particular ecosystem. All states within their technological and other capabilities try to control these waters to the extent that they can. But most important of all, they are lacking in significance. So for most human beings, the seas are empty. The seas are not seen as being critical to the health of the planet, to the global ecosystem. The seas are not seen as being fundamental to cooperation between nations. The seas are not seen as the highways, not just of commerce, but of culture. And that is, in fact, one of the reasons why the seas continue to be neglected and maritime resources continue to be overexploited. Um, and why, apart from a few communities that live by the sea and depend upon the sea, the sea is basically missing from all of our historical and cultural narratives. You know, so when you learn history uh, as, as a young school student, Almost all of that history is played out on land. There's almost no history that is taught to the average school child about what's going on 
on the waters of the world, on, on the oceans of the world. And that is something that I think we need to remember. So, on behalf of Goa University, we would like very much to welcome you to this attempt of ours to present marine science to you in all of its complexity and dimensions. And we felt it would be useful for us to begin with a lecture that did not focus so much on the science that is linked to our oceans, but on, shall we say, the human and social science dimension of our oceans. But we promise you that you're going to have a series of lectures in this course that are going to be delivered by quite truly some of the best scientific minds in their respective domains. And I would, while we wrap up this final module of this lecture, like to briefly present all of the my fellow resource persons to you. So we are going to next have Dr. D. Shankar, who will be speaking to us on wind-driven circulation. He's a Patnagar awardee and a senior principal scientist at the CSIR National Institute of Oceanography followed by Dr. M. Ravi Chandran, who will be speaking on observations in oceanography. Dr. Ravi Chandran is director of the National Center for Polar Research, which used to be earlier called the National Center for Antarctic and Ocean Research. After that, we'll have Dr. Lidita Khandeparkar, who is a senior scientist at the CSIR National Institute of Oceanography. And she will be delivering a lecture on biocommunications in the ocean, followed by Professor A.D. Rao of the Indian Institute of Technology, Delhi, who will be delivering a lecture on storm surge. Then Dr. Aninda Majumdar, a principal scientist at the CSIR National Institute of Oceanography, will deliver a lecture on gas hydrates, followed by Dr. A.C. Anil, who is the chief scientist at the CSIR National Institute of Oceanography, who will be speaking on marine bioinvasion. Dr. M. A. Atmanand will follow. Dr. Atmanand is director, National Institute of Ocean Technology, and he will be delivering a lecture on ocean thermal energy conversion. Dr. Datesh Desai is a senior scientist at the CSIR National Institute of Oceanography, and he will be delivering a lecture on marine invertebrate. Professor Harilal Menon, who is also the coordinator of, of this entire lecture series, a professor at the Department of Marine Science, Goa University, will deliver a lecture on remote sensing of coastal waters to retrieve chlorophyll A. Dr. Parthasarthi Chakrabarti, a senior scientist at CSIR National Institute of Oceanography, also a Bhatnagar Awardee, will be delivering a lecture on marine pollution. Dr. Pavan Devangan, senior scientist, CSIR National Institute of Oceanography, will deliver a lecture on marine seismics. Professor C.U. Rivonkar, the Department of Marine Science, Goa University, will deliver a lecture on anthropogenic impact of marine biodiversity and ecosystem function. Dr. V.V.S. Sarma, Senior Principal Scientist, CSIR National Institute of Oceanography, will deliver a lecture on ocean minima zone in the Arabian Sea. Dr. S. C. Shenoy, who is Director of the Indian National Center for Ocean Information Service, will deliver a lecture on tsunamis. Dr. Thamban Meloth, the Scientist F. at the National Center for Polar Research, will deliver a lecture on Antarctica in a Changing World. Dr. N. L. Thakur, Principal Scientist at the CSIR National Institute of Oceanography, will deliver a lecture on drugs from the sea. Dr. K. K. Vijayan, who is Director of the Central Institute of Brackish Water Aquaculture, will deliver a lecture on fisheries and biotechnology. Professor P. N. Vinay Chandran of the Indian Institute of Science, a Bhatnagar awardee, 
will speak on thermohaline circulation. Once again, on behalf of Goa University, welcome to the series of lectures being prepared by the National Resource Center in Marine Science at our university. Thank you.